Right, okay. Good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so welcome to the Nodeswood Revision Hangout for the uh, Triple Physics. Um, what I'm hoping to do for you this evening is uh, just kind of reassure you that um, you know, uh, you know, you already know plenty about this uh, this, this P3 um, course. I think compared to P1 and P2, I think we're going to find that the P3 paper um, shouldn't carry as many surprises for us as maybe the, the P2 or the P1 can sometimes. And um, that we really just want to feel kind of confident about what we already know. Um, and just to, to kind of revisit um, all of the different topics and just what the key scientific points are for them all. So I anticipate that this, this uh, broadcast will only take about half an hour um, just to kind of pick out some of the main points from each, each of the topics and just to really reassure us that, that you guys uh, are already know plenty. Um, so this is, this is not a place for us to be uh, doing any last minute panic revision. Um, I'd also suggest as well that if, if you do want to go into any more detail, you can still go and watch the, the other um, part one and part two for triple physics for the P3, and they go through in a bit more detail. They'll, they look at past uh, paper questions. I'm not going to do any of that today. We're just going to look at some of the key topics and hopefully become, um, you know, just to reassure our, ourselves that we already know plenty about them. So if we have a quick look up at, at the key topics here, we're going to start with x-rays and ultrasounds um, in this first part of P1. Have a look at some rules on ray diagrams and how we use lenses to fix our, our eye problems, short-sightedness, long-sightedness. Have a quick look at the eye. Um, then uh, we're going to be looking at uh, centre of mass as well, how we find the centre of mass, um, how it affects stability, so objects toppling over like um, cars going around corners. A um, little look at lasers and optics. Um, then in the, for the second half of the physics uh, P3, we're just going to have a quick look at hydraulics. What are the key scientific bits we need to know about hydraulic systems? Um, circular motion, so objects going around in circles. Um, again, the lenses will fit in with the first half. Um, moments, so that's levers, um, seesaws. Uh, then we're going to little look, have a look at uh, magnetic fields, so how we know which way the field lines are going around a uh, round a magnet and uh, transformers, so step up and step down transformers, and then this motor effect about making uh, wires which carry current, making them move. Um, so let's uh, crack on then, and we're going to start off with um, x rays and um, uh, just looking at x rays initially. So we're going to, if we just have a look at some facts about x rays, well, x rays are around the size of an atom. Um, so they, uh, it's one of those little facts that you sometimes get asked about. So x-rays are around the size, of, the wavelength is around the size of an atom. Now when we look at one of these pictures up here, we can see that the, the screen actually starts off as, as white. Um, so when an x-ray hits the uh, photographic film or the CCD, um, charge couple device, um, when, they, when the x-rays hit those, they turn it black. So we can almost use that just to imagine what must be going on here. So the white is where bone is absorbing the x-rays and the flesh, which is slightly darker, the flesh is transmitting. Okay, so flesh is transmitting and bone is absorbing. Okay, so um, that's how they, 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 they produce really clear pictures for bones, um, but not so good at looking at soft materials. So if we wanted to look at how the stomach was inside the, inside the abdomen, an x-ray wouldn't be the best way of looking at that. Um, so a CT um, scan is where they build up, a, this is a, th uh, a CT scanner down here, this is where they build up a 3D image, but by taking lots of two-dimensional pictures. So they'll take slices through the body, um, they'll take a little slice through the body there, and then they'll build that up in a computer program to take to make a full three-dimensional model, if you like, of the of the human. Um, so that's CT scanning. Uh, they will they will also use X-rays for treating cancer. So because X-rays are similar in in wavelength to gamma rays, um, we can we can focus them at cancerous cells, and we can treat cancers uh, using them. Some of the some of the safety uh, you need to um, be aware of when um, you know using X-rays frequently is we might have to wear lead aprons. Um, uh, radiographers, the people that take X-rays every day, they'll be stood behind a um, a lead screen or a lead wall, and most importantly, just to just to reduce your um, your exposure. So that just means to be around X-rays as little as possible. Okay, lovely. So that's X-rays in a nutshell. 
So x-rays are taught alongside ultrasound because there's, they quite often make comparisons between them. So an ultrasound is any sound which is above 20,000 hertz. So that's the, the frequency of it there. So 20,000 vibrations per second, if you like, or oscillations per second. Um, so it's above um, 20,000. Or we can just say it's um, higher than the human hearing. So uh, higher than human. And that's literally the definition of it. Um, OK, I mean, what is it? It's, it's vibrating particles, uh, just like a sound wave. So uh, vibrating air molecules or vibrating through a solid. Um, now, we can. Th a really common use of them is to uh, take images of babies. Again, doesn't cause cancer, so that's why we can we can use um, ultrasound. It's just vibrations of particles, so completely safe. Um, it's non-ionizing. Our X-rays are ionizing. Ultrasound isn't. Um, so really safe to use on on images of unborn fetuses. Now, how we get the image here is because, I and mean, if we have a look over at this side over here. Um, every time the sound wave hits a boundary, there is a small amount of reflection and a lot of it gets transmitted through the boundary. Here's, let's say, a boundary between uh, bone and skin or muscle and fat. So at every boundary between two different um, materials, there's a little bit of reflection and a little bit of transmission. So we can put a detector next to uh, the skin. So let's say we've got a layer of skin here and uh, underneath the skin we have fat and behind this fat we have bone well if we put our emitter and our detector just up here um, at each interface there will be a small amount of reflection now we can pick up these reflections um, with the uh, with the detector that's in the transmitter here and that will be connected to an oscilloscope and on the oscilloscope we will be able to see the reflection pulses. So this is the pulse that's been sent to the skin and back again. This is the pulse that's gone to the bone and back again to the detector. So what's important to note is that this time it takes is for the um, transmission to go from the emitter to the skin and back again. So if you're ever being asked to use um, distance equals speed times time, and you, you're given the speed of the sound wave through the material and you're given the time or you'll have to work out the time from the uh, from the oscilloscope trace um, all you have to do is make sure that when you do speed equal uh, speed times time that you that you're working out the distance for it to go to the surface and back again so at the end just divide that distance by two Okay, and just be careful that some questions ask expect you to divide it by two and some questions don't. So just be clear from the wording in the question whether they want just the distance there from the, um, from the emitter to the surface or do they want it for the uh, distance to go there and back again. And you should be able to work that out from the question. Okay, so typical uses of this might be to find flaws like a crack in a bolt or maybe a girder um, used for, for making buildings. Um, uh, ultrasound is also used for removing um, kidney stones. So they literally vibrate the uh, the stones apart. They vibrate them apart, and they will just pass out uh, with the urine. Uh, they could also be used for cleaning um, kind of delicate watches, um, antiques, uh, things like that. Okay, so that's ultrasound. Be prepared that you've got to compare those to X-rays. Um, just remember your twenty thousand hertz and your your X-rays are an electromagnetic um, wave. Your X-rays are a, um, a transverse wave um, that carry energy. Um, so just be prepared to talk about some of those. Okay, so lenses then. Um, so refractive index, when we talk about lenses, we really need to nail this idea of refractive index. Well, refractive index is just a measurement of how much light is bent um, by a particular material. Now, when we look at this glass block here, this is a glass block. Here we have our ray of light coming into the glass block. Well, this glass block, because it's denser than the air above it, because it's denser, it will make the light bend. And as the light bends, the amount that it bends light, um, we, we call the refractive index. And every material we have, you know, each different type of glass, each different type of see through plastic, uh, each material has its own refractive index. And it's a measure of how much this bends um, light. Now, there is an equation for refractive index, and that's the sine of the angle of incidence over the sine of the angle of reflect, reflect, um, refraction. Now, the chances are, as you might be asked, 
to uh, work out either I, angle of incidence, or R. So just to make sure that you're happy to rearrange them. Now, if, you're, if you want to work out what I equals, well, then this part of the equation has to go up to the top up here. So we're going to times both sides by sine of R. So that leaves you with N times the sine of R equals the sine of I. Now, if we want to remove this sine part from over here, we can't divide both sides by sine. It doesn't really work like that. So we've got to do a different function, which is the inverse sine of. So sine to the minus 1 of N sine of R. Okay, and that equals our I. Now, again, if we need to find R, then we need to rearrange it just slightly differently. So again, we take our n equals sine i over r, and we will um, we want to pop this up the top and bring the n back down. So we're going to end up with sine of i over n equals sine of r. And again, we can't just kind of divide both sides by sine, so we have to do this inverse sine function. So sine to the minus 1 of sine of i over n equals r. So that you might be asked to rearrange those, so just make sure you're happy with both of those. Now, another way of uh, another thing to be aware of is that this equation here only works for less to more dense. Now, that might mean that you need to um, reverse these this equation if you're looking at the refraction that happens here, for example. So we know that when it comes out of the glass block, it's going to bend back. Um, parallel with the way it came but you'll notice that the of course this becomes your angle of incidence that there is your angle of incidence and then if I carry on the normal that there is the angle of refraction refraction well if we just think that this equation should always be sine of the big angle over sine of the small angle that way if we remember that that works in both situations. All, the, all we remember that this equation here only works for less dense to more dense. We've got to swap it around for more dense to less dense. So be prepared for that. Okay, so uh, two different types of lenses uh, that may be put into spectacles. Um, these two different types of lenses um, bend light in a different way. So we've got our concave over here because both sides of the lens look like caves. And so this one, by process of elimination, must be convex. OK, now the convex um, is also known as converging. And this one over here is known as diverging. Now, I think di is Greek or Latin for um, come apart or go apart and con is um, I think Latin for coming together so con means to come together di means to split apart so that might help us remember those two um, so these are both useful for correcting vision um, now the something that we need to be aware of is that the power of these lenses basically like the stronger the power of your glasses or your contact lens the power is worked out by one over the focal length now the focal length is from the center of the lens up to the focal point where the rays cross or similarly if the rays don't actually cross on the on the right hand side they may cross um, through virtual lines that we can draw back so again the focal length will just be from the center of the lens to the um, uh, to the focal point there. Now, if you imagine that these lenses are stronger, well, what happens to the focal point? Well, if this lens is stronger, it's going to bend light more, and so this focal point is going to move towards the lens. So, in other words, it's making the focal length shorter. So, the stronger the power, the shorter the focal length. And the same over here, the, you know, the shorter the focal length, the stronger the power of the lens. Okay, good. Okay, so let's have a quick look at this uh, ray diagram then. So as we look at a convex uh, lens, there are three golden rules for drawing ray diagrams. Okay, we're going to draw a, a ray undeflected straight through the lens. So that is this ray undeflected straight through the center of the lens. Doesn't change direction, straight line. Second rule, draw a ray parallel to the axis, and that bends through the focal point on the far side. 
And then should we need it, we don't always need this third ray, but this third rule is draw a ray through the focus on this side, and then when it hits the lens, it goes parallel. Now where the rays cross, that is where our image is going to be. So the rays crossed over here. The image, therefore, is we're going to say it is um, inverted. So inverted, um, it's not upright. So just so we know all the terms we might have to use for our images. So this one is an inverted image. It's not upright. Um, it looks like I'm going to pretend that it's magnified. I can't quite tell, but let's just pretend that it's magnified. And if it's if it's magnified, then it's not diminished. So diminished is our word for getting smaller. Um, and then this one is a real image. It's not virtual. So there's a couple of ways of thinking about whether or not it's a real image. If it appears on this side of the lens, on the opposite side to the object, then it's going to be a real image because it means we can project it on a screen. Um, whereas if the image is virtual, the image may appear over on this side, um, either in front of the object or behind the object. Um, that means we can't project it on a screen, and so we call it a virtual image. Okay, so we can see here with a um, with a concave lens, we may find that the image doesn't appear on the right-hand side. So we're going to still follow the three golden rules. Draw a ray undeflected through the center of the lens. Draw a ray parallel to the axis and then through the, uh, through the focus. Now we know that these types of rays, at uh, these types of lenses, spread the rays out. So we know that we have to expect our rays to come out like that from the lens. So that means that the focal point um, for this must be must be on the left hand side. So we're going to draw the rays back through the focus as we see here Back through the focus and where our rays cross is going to be our image so So we can see here that our image is where the lines cross there now again should it is possible to have the object really nice and close to the lens here, and the image appears much bigger, but slightly further away. This could be a um, magnifying glass. So again, we just trace the rays back. If the rays don't cross on the right-hand side, trace the rays back, and they will cross eventually, um, unless they're completely parallel to each other. So that'd be where our image is. Okay, when we apply this to an exam question, we've got nice, um, um, a nice grid drawn up on here for us. So the three golden rules, one ray straight through the lens. One ray parallel to the to the axis. This black line is our axis along here. Parallel to the axis, hits the lens, goes through the focal point on this side. And should we need it, there's our third rule. Goes through the focal point on this side, goes parallel to the lens. Okay, we can see our image is where the um, uh, where the lines cross. So we could say about this image, it's diminished, it's inverted, but it's real. Okay, same thing again. Um, you know, draw the draw the rays. So first ray straight through the lens. Ignore the eye there. It's really just um, just to irritate you. Um, doesn't really help us because not all the rays hit the eye. So first ray goes straight through the lens. Second ray goes parallel to the axis and through the focal point. Don't worry that it's not going through the lens. That's a naughty thing that they do. You need to just change the direction of it when it's a you know on that central central line through the lens. Um, and then this last one is. Drawing a ray through the focus on this side, well, that's behind it, so my line is going to be all the way up here. And again, when I hit the hit the uh, hit this lens, go parallel to the axis. And again, this this um, this uh, the may not need this third ray. We're just looking for where the lines cross. As soon as you've got two lines crossing, that's where your image is. Um, so we draw these rays all the way back, and we're going to see that these rays cross over here. So we have a magnified, upright, and um, virtual image. Okay, so the eye. So we, in this physics topic, they'll ask you to, um, they'll ask us to be able to understand the structure of the eye and how the structures allow the eye to do its job. Um, then they might talk about um, short-sightedness and long-sightedness and how we correct it using the lenses that we were just looking at. So they may ask us how we focus. Well, if we're, if we're looking at focusing, um, we, uh, we need to think about when we're looking at things far away and when we're looking at things close up. So I always think that when we are looking at something far away, 
kind of go off into this dreamy state and the muscles relax when we're looking at long distance. So you can stare off into the distance, eyes nice and relaxed, looking far away. Now that must mean that the lens is thin. The lens is very thin when we're looking at things far away because we don't need to bend the light very much to get it to focus on the back. We only need to get it to bend a little bit. With objects close to us, we'd have to make the light bend a lot to be able to focus on the back. When the objects are really far away, you're looking at a flower in the distance, um, then your eyes are relaxed and the lens is thin. So hard work when you're just reading something close up to you, looking at a computer screen, um, your ciliary muscles um, are, are tense. Um, that's because you're looking at things close to you and that your lens becomes fatter. Or should probably say rounder. So the, so the lens becomes more round. Now we need the lens to be nice and round when we look at flowers which are very close up to us because it's got to bend the light more than when it's from far away. So you see the angles of these, we need to bend these more to be able to get them to come onto the back of the eye. Compared to rays which are coming from far away, um, they are going to be coming in at less of an angle. So they need to be bent less. Okay, so looking far away, your muscles are relaxed and the lens is thin. Looking close up, your muscles are tensed um, and the lens is round. Okay, so now you might, be, you might be asked to compare the eye to a camera. And really, there's only a limited number of things they can ask you about this. Um, at the back of a uh, camera, you have either a CCD, just like on the x-rays, that's a charged coupled device, um, or film, photographic film, just like you get in, in an old-fashioned camera. Um, in the eye, we have the retina. And the retina is covered with light-sensitive cells. Um, if we want to change focus um, on the, in the eye or the lens and the uh, ciliary muscles, help the lens change shape. So again, fatter for closer up objects, thinner for distant objects. Here, the, um, the lens moves um, with respect to uh, the film. So the lens will either move further out uh, for looking at things close up, or it will come closer to the film when looking at things far away. If you just imagine a photographer looking, taking a picture of something close up, they have to make their lens move out um, and they kind of zoom in, if you like, and that's the, the lens um, coming away from the film. So just remember to include that you're moving it away from the film, uh, either away or towards the film. So you move it away from the film, looking at objects that are close up, move it towards the film for objects that are far away. And finally, how, to, how we control the amount of light coming into our eye. Well, we use um, the pupil is the hole that the light goes into. Um, so it's the iris um, which changes size um, to control the amount of light coming in. So iris and pupil. And uh, for the camera, it's something called an aperture. Um, which is on the front of a camera when you look at it, sometimes you get these kind of uh, kind of shapes on the outside of them. And this shape here will get bigger or smaller um, to let in less or more light depending on how bright it is in the, in the room for the, uh, for the photo you're taking. Okay, so just be prepared to compare those, those two things. So then um, last little bit on, um, on eyes, then we're just going to have a look at correcting vision now. So in normal eyesight, we say people with 20-20 vision, um, people with healthy, good eyesight can see things far away and close up. Well, then that, that means that the image is being formed um, on the back of the um, retina, clearly. Now, when you're nearsighted or short-sighted, um, like myself, I can't see things that are far away. So I can see things in the short sight or in the near sight. So the problem with that is that my, um, my lens is too strong and the image is being focused on the inside of my eye. So we can say that the either the, um, the eye is um, too big 
or my lens is too strong. So for far-sighted people, this tends to be the older generation, uh, the older you get, um, the more far-sighted you get, which means you can't see things close up. You can see things far away. Now this can either be for two reasons, that the lens is too weak, you see it's not focusing the lenses in enough, it's not bending the lens, uh, the rays of light enough, or we have the eyeball is too small. So the eyeball is too small or the lens is too weak for, um, for long-sightedness. Okay, so how we correct these then is really we're just going to make the, um, the rays change a little bit before they enter the eye. So here, to correct short-sightedness or near-sightedness, we need to put a concave lens in. And as you can see, what it does here is it just makes the rays spread out a little bit before they hit the lens, so that we're kind of doing a bit of the work for the lens already, um, um, just spreading some of the rays out a little bit, so that now when they hit the lens, they'll focus perfectly on the back of the retina. Okay, and again for uh, far-sightedness, so um, for looking at things which are um, uh, close up, so if you're, um, then we're going to pop a convex lens just in front, and that's going to help just to bring the rays together a little bit and help that focus on the, on the back of the eye there. Okay, so lasers and optics. Um, only really a couple of things we need to know about this, so um, I'm going to write it in bold, T-I-R. Um, total, maybe I'll switch to the pen, total internal reflection. Okay, so that just explains how, um, how light stays inside an optical fibre, which is a thin piece of glass, maybe the width of a hair, shine light in at the end, and it totally internally reflects at each boundary. Now, we can see internal reflection whenever we look at a window. If you stand side onto a window, um, you can see almost completely clearly, it acts like a mirror almost. And that's because of total internal reflection. So if we look over at this image over here, we can see that we're shining light up, a, I think this light is inside water, and above it we've got air. Now as the light hits the, as it goes straight through the water, it doesn't bend at all, but at larger angles of incidence, here, here, and here, at larger angles of incidence, it bends more and more until a certain critical angle, a special angle, where the ray goes along the boundary of the, of the water there. Okay, so that's the critical angle. Now, it makes sense that different materials have got different critical angles because all materials bend light differently. So the refractive index, as in how much it bends light, equals 1 over sine of the critical angle. Um, so you will be either given the critical angle or you'll be given the refractive index and asked to calculate the other. So um, should you be asked to work out the critical angle, you would need to do, um, well, let's rearrange the equation. So sine of C equals 1 over N. So therefore C equals sine to the minus 1 of 1 over N. Okay, lovely. Okay, so second half of uh, P3, um, we're just going to have a little look at moments, um, levers, um, and seesaws, how we balance them. So uh, levers are force multipliers, um, just means that you can apply a small force and they can apply a bigger force somewhere else. Examples are using a hammer to pull out a pin, or scissors, there's our pivot there, uh, we have a load here as we're trying to um, cut through something and there's the effort we apply. So the, the, um, the moment um, is going to be the force times the distance from the pivot. So a moment is just like a turning force if we like. So the turning force is found by the force that you're applying times the distance from the pivot. Um, putting into our equation triangle like so. Okay, now if we, if we want to balance um, a seesaw, for example, we need to make sure that the uh, anti-clockwise moment is equal to the clockwise moment. So in this case, uh, we do Garfield's weight, or his downward force, times by the distance he is from the pivot, and that should equal the distance to OD um, uh, times by the weight or the force of him pushing down. So if those two things balance, then you know that the... Uh, the the moments are balanced and um, the seesaw will be balanced. Okay, finding center of masses then. If we've got a regular shape, 
nice and easy for us to find the center of mass. You just find the lines of symmetry and center of mass will be where the lines cross. Um, if you want to find the uh, center of gravity or center of mass of an irregular shape, so either a piece of card or some other odd shape, um, you suspend it from a point. You put a pin in it and hang it, and it, you let it hang freely. When it hangs freely, the center of gravity is always directly below the pivot. You get up a plumb line, which is a piece of string with a mass on the end, and you hang it from the same point. And where the line hangs, gravity is pulling it directly downwards, and it's also pulling the, the object directly downwards. You mark on crosses, and you uh, hang it from a different point, do the same again, mark on crosses, hang it from a third point, mark on crosses where the, where the uh, line goes, and where the lines cross, that should be your centre of gravity, because the centre of gravity will always be below the point you're hanging an object from. Okay, so stability of objects. So here we've got um, uh, objects which are toppling and objects which are not toppling. So if we have a look at this car here, um, this car, we can say it has a, uh, a resultant moment. Basically just means that there's a resultant force it's going to fall over. So resultant moment um, because the um, line of action of center of mass I've just uh, shortened that to COM. So the line of action of center of mass, or um, the uh, this is the line of action of center of mass. So the um, I could just say the center of mass is um, outside of the base for this for this vehicle, and inside of the base for this one. So this one is going to topple because it has a resultant moment um, where the line of action of the center of mass falls outside the base. So when we look at from the center of mass, we draw a line down. If the base of the car, we can say, is between the two wheels here, because the line of action of the center of mass is outside, is past that wheel, this vehicle is going to topple over. Um, however, this one here is not going to topple over because the line of action of the center of mass is within the base. Okay, and here we've got um, a classic double-decker bus example. Um, this one will... Um, uh, right itself again if it was to tip up to that angle because the center of mass falls within the, the base and this one here is just past the um, outside wheel so this bus would topple over. So if we want to make something more stable we need a wider base like so, like this vehicle, um, or we need a lower center of mass. Um, lower center of mass, the lower down this is, the harder you've got to tip it or the further you've got to tip it before the center of mass falls outside the base there. Okay, so quick bit on pendulums then. Um, so the longer the thread, the longer the um, uh, piece of string that's holding the pendulum, the bigger the time period, the longer it will take to swing backwards and forwards. Um, it's good to know that a time period is the time taken to go from one end to the other and back again. It's like a, a complete wave, if you like. A wave has to include a peak and a trough, um, or a there and back again, if you like. So the same for these pendulums. So it's, all the way there and all the way back again. And the frequency, which means how many times per second, um, the frequency of a, of a pendulum is found by one over the time period. So the longer the time period, if the time period is big, um, the frequency is small. And similarly, if the time period is um, uh, small, the frequency is big. Because if it takes not very long to swing there and back again, you're going to get lots per second. Okay, the, the mass of the, of the, of the um, object here on the ends doesn't, doesn't affect the, the time period, um, but the length of it does. Okay, so hydraulics. Hydraulics, again, are force multipliers. That's a way of us applying a small force to a lever and it applying a big force, um, force big enough to be able to lift up a car. Um, now, how these work are we've got our master piston. Uh, we've got our slave piston because it does our does our bidding for us. Uh, we tell it what to do. Now, um, why hydraulics work? So hydraulics work because um, liquids are incompressible. Now, it, um, liquids are incompressible, which means that when I um, apply a pressure here, that same pressure transmits through my fluid, round corners, 
round bends and will transmit that same pressure here. So pressure uh, that I apply at the master piston, the pressure is transmitted equally. In all directions. Um, now then, how how what science can we you know how can we start to apply um, you know science to be able to do calculations with this? Well, this is the science behind it. If the pressure is transmitted equally, then my pressure at the at the master piston is the same as the pressure at the slave piston. Well, then what we can do is we can change the area of the pistons. And by me having a small area here and applying a small force, if I make the area much bigger over here, I therefore the, the force must get much bigger to have the same pressure. So this um, force over area at the master piston is the same as the force over the area at the master piston. So normally they would give you maybe force and area here, and they would give you the area here and ask you to calculate the force. Well, if you just work out the pressure first, work out the pressure at one end, you know that same pressure applies over here, and so you'll already know the pressure at this side. So you can just rearrange the equation to find the, the, the missing value. Okay, circular motion. So this is objects going around a circle. Um, now velocity is, is speed and direction. Now this, this here, because velocity is speed and direction, um, because it's changing direction, strictly speaking, the velocity is changing as well. Now the speed may remain the same, it may be going at two meters per second, but because the uh, direction is changing, the velocity is changing. Now if the velocity is changing, it must be accelerating. So by swinging a ball around on a piece of string, um, the, there is always an acceleration towards the center of the circle. So as we can see here with the arrows, that as I swing a conch around on a string, that there is always, the, the conch is always accelerating towards the center, even if its speed is constant. It could be going at two meters per second as a constant speed, but because its direction is changing, it's accelerating towards the center. Now, um, if it's accelerating towards the center of the circle, as we've just said, there must be a force that's making it accelerate. So this force is called the uh, centripetal force, um, so centripetal force is uh, always towards the center of a circle and centripetal force can be due to th maybe three things. So for a car, it's the friction between the wheels and the road that are keeping the car going around the circle. Of course, if we imagine putting oil onto the road, uh, the oil stops the friction, the car goes off in a straight line, stops going around in a circle. If it's a satellite or a moon, it's gravity that causes the centripetal force. And on a, a fairground ride or a conquer on a on a string, it's tension that's in the um, tension in the cables that keep it in circular motion. Okay, so magnetic fields. Um, whenever a uh, current uh, goes through a wire, it creates a magnetic field. So moving electric charges create magnetic fields. Um, now we can, if we look at this cable here, and that I just tells us that current is going through it. Um, if we know the direction of the current, we can work out the direction of the field lines. Now field lines always go north to south, so these arrows, if you like, are kind of showing us our north to south directions. And this is where we use the right hand grip rule. So this is just for where we've got a, a wire carrying current. We apply the right hand grip rule and we should see that on our um, we can use our fingers to tell us which, which the direction of the field lines are. So the direction of our fingers has got the arrows coming around the outside of the cable like so. Okay, now we can make field lines add up. I don't just have to use uh, one wire in a, in a straight line to, um, to create electromagnets. So this is an electromagnet that could be used in a, in a, uh, a car recycling plant uh, to pick up metal. Um, so if I want to um, make magnets really strong, a really strong electromagnet, I can coil the wire up and I can add a soft iron core through the middle of it. And all of those field lines, which we see over here on this side, um, all of those field lines will add up and create a really strong magnet, um, an electromagnet. Okay, so because if I put current through a wire, it creates a magnetic field. 
well, I can be really cheeky. I can put this current carrying wire and I can put it in a magnetic field. So it's all, it creates its own magnetic field. When I put it in a magnetic field and I let the current go through it, these magnetic fields interact and the wire experiences a force. It literally moves, um, as, as we saw in, in demos in, in class. Um, so because the magnetic field from the wire here, that it creates its own magnetic field, and I'm placing that within another magnetic field between these two magnets, those two um, fields will, uh, will interact with each other and will create a force. Now, you will be asked to, you'll be given the direction of the field or the direction of the current, and you'll be asked to work out the uh, direction of the motion or the force that the wire feels. Now, to do this, we use Fleming's left-hand rule. Now, expertly drawn out here on our um, on our fingers is a three-dimensional axis. So, um, kind of up and down, uh, you're kind of out of the screen, and you're kind of left to right. So, here we have using our left-hand rule. Um, thumb indicates the movement or motion. So, just see the second letter there in thumb. That tells us the motion, so the force, uh, the direction of the force. Uh, the forefinger is field, so your forefinger is the field, so the first letter there tells us the direction of the field lines. Now, really important, field lines go north to south. They go north to south. Okay, always north to south. We can see here north to south, field lines here north to south. Okay, your second finger, so the C there in the second finger, tells us the current. And again, as it says here, that the current goes plus to minus. Okay, must go plus to minus, so we can see here, there's a plus, there's the minus on our battery. I, I will know which way the current is going because the current always goes plus to minus. Then I use my Fleming's left-hand rule to, let's just say on this example here, it tells us the direction of the current, tells us the direction of the field lines. Well, I have to negotiate my fingers into the right, into the right directions, so my second finger will be going out of the screen, my field lines will be going left to right, now, I can tell as I'm doing that in front of me that my thumb now is pointing upright. So that is the direction of the force that is, that is felt by that wire. Now, when they first discovered this, they thought this is absolutely amazing. But even more amazing is what we can actually use it for. So lots of um, modern, um, uh, modern machinery will use electric motors in them, whether it be an electric car, uh, whether it be a hoover, um, anything with that takes in electricity and, and creates motion or kinetic energy. So, um, again, the science behind this is exactly the same as you've, you've already seen. Um, a current carrying wire placed inside a magnetic field experiences a force, is, is this the way to word it. So a current, a current carrying wire placed in a magnetic field experiences a force. And you, you might be asked to say which way round this, um, this um, uh, coil inside a magnet, which way it will spin. Well, it can either spin um, anti-clockwise or it can spin clockwise. Okay, the blue line may either come up or the blue line may go down. The red line may come up or the red line may come down. So the way to think about this is we need to apply Fleming's left-hand rule, but let's just pick one side. So I said a few things. Um, field lines always go north to south. They're drawn in on here. They're already drawn in for us. Current goes from plus to minus. So current will go away from us up this blue side and will come back towards us up this red side. Okay, so we pick a side because we can only, we can only use our Fleming's left-hand rule on one side at a time. So let's just pick the blue side. So we've got our current, therefore our second finger going into the screen. Okay, we have our field lines going left to right again. Okay, and that should mean that my thumb, if my second finger is pointing into the screen, my thumb is now pointing up. So I think that this blue side will go up. But I'm gonna double check it, just to make sure. So I will take the other side now, and if I just uh, rub out my workings here. So now if I take the red side, well the red side has got the uh, current coming out of the screen and the field lines are still to the left. So if I make my... Oh, I did it around the wrong way first time round. Oh, this just as well I, I did a double check on it. So this, <laughs> so for the left hand side here, for the red side, we've got my current coming out of the screen, my field lines going to the left and my thumb pointing up. So just as well I did a double check on it, 
is that on the red side we're going up and finally let's just double check the blue side again so blue side we have our current going into the screen so my second finger my middle finger is pointing towards the computer um, my field lines are still going to the left now of course my thumb is pointed down silly me I didn't do it right so well worth double checking your workings so we are going to have this is going to spin clockwise excellent okay then on to uh, our last little bit of p3 so transformers uh, transformers are uh, include step up and step down uh, transformers and include the transmission cables not the pylons as I found out recently These pylons are not part of it apparently um, so what do we need to do to know well a step up transformer steps up voltage um, so we step up voltage but at the same time because we can't have money for nothing the current has to go down um, a step down transformer that brings down the voltage and again we can't make energy disappear so at the same time we're going to increase the current why do we do this it's simply to save money um, a high current through the transmission cables will increase resistance in it if there's a high resistance it'll get hot if it gets hot it's wasting energy so wasting electricity um, so and we just step down the voltage just to safe levels for our consumers so we don't fry them um, okay now when we start to look inside transformers um, we're going to see something like this we have a soft iron core and here we have um, copper wires surrounded probably by an insulator uh, plastic insulator and we can see here we've got our positive terminal and our negative terminal so this could be this here is a step down transformer this will be coming from the national grid and this over here will be going to our our household now notice the current and electricity does not go through the iron core the current literally just stays in this side and um, somehow electricity appears over on this side while well, the somehow is called electromagnetic induction so electromagnetic induction is where a changing magnetic field in the primary coils a changing magnetic field which is caused by alternating current so your current is flipping backwards and forwards this creates a magnetic field which flips direction because of our you know um, our, our right hand grip rule um, that a magnetic field is created around this if I switch the direction of the current the magnetic field switches so electromagnetic induction is where a changing magnetic field causes caused by um, alternating current in the primary is felt by the secondary coil so this changing magnetic field is felt by the electrons in this um, uh, secondary coil they're in, its mag in the magnetic field from the primary coil, so they feel a force. Um, they feel uh, a voltage, if you like. They're pushed backwards and forwards um, in this piece of wire. So I'll say that again. So electromagnetic induction is where a changing magnetic field in the primary coil caused by an alternating current is felt by the secondary coil, and that induces a voltage in it. Um, now we can use the number of turns on this, it's the number of coils on here that tells us, that explains whether this is a step up or a step down transformer. Now this one, the number of turns goes down, so this is a step down transformer. Because um, the ratio of this number of coils here to the number of turns here, those ratios also leads us to having the same ratio in the voltages. So the number of turns on the secondary coil over the number of turns on the primary coil is equal to the, num uh, the voltage in the secondary and the voltage in the primary. Okay, now this equation, because it's a ratio, can be flipped upside down if it helps you. Okay, so you've got to flip both sides, of course, but the, um, the voltage in the secondary over the voltage in the primary is equal to the number of turns on the secondary coil and number of turns on the primary coil. So you might be given the number of turns on this side and the number of turns here, You'll be given the voltage on maybe one side and you'll be asked to calculate the voltage on the other. Now the only other thing you might be asked to do is to calculate the power on one side um, or the other. Now because power equals um, I times V, um, you might have to use that the voltage times the current on the primary side is equal to the voltage times the current on the secondary side. 
And if you think about it, that must make sense because we're not going to make energy appear out of nowhere. So your total measurement of electricity of voltage and current must be the same on both sides. One last thing about transformers. Um, you should be aware of switch mode transformers. A switch mode transformer, it's just like any other transformer, um, but it's used, uh, it's at a much higher frequency, and so it's a bit more efficient than normal transformers, and it's typically used for things like laptops. So if you've got a laptop charger in front of you, it's got a switch mode transformer in it. All that means is, is it operates at a much higher frequency, um, you know, maybe 20,000 hertz instead of 60 hertz, and it's uh, more efficient. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, best of luck with your, uh, um, with your rest and relaxation before tomorrow morning's exam. I uh, wish you all the best of luck. Um, should you have any last uh, questions at all, obviously put them through, uh, put them through Frog, and um, feel free to watch the, the other two Hangouts again for P3. Um, but probably best thing to do is make sure you've eaten a good meal, get a good night's sleep, wake up in the morning, have some good breakfast, um, and feel really positive about it. Um, it's been a pleasure teaching you, ladies and gentlemen, and I wish you all the best in tomorrow's exam. Okay, thank you very much.